greatest economic crisis the world has seen since the Second World War. And uh, she got to work quickly, providing liquidity to over 80 countries in a very short space of time, and presided and led the historic allocation of special drawing rights, and uh, uh, has also innovated with a very exciting instrument uh, that serves to reallocate resources from countries with strong external balances to those uh, who have uh, more vulnerable uh, situations. Uh, Kristalina is here this afternoon and we'll learn a lot more about the new instruments that she has put together. Welcome, uh, Kristalina, please. And joining us online in this brave new digital world is a wonderful friend of the entire Caribbean from her time as foreign minister uh, of Canada and uh, now as deputy prime minister and finance minister of Canada, uh, Chris, uh, Christian Freeland, who has played uh, an instrumental role uh, from the perspective of the G7 in bringing forth this uh, new uh, paradigm that we're about to describe here today. The pandemic has also affected Canada and the response uh, led by uh, Christia has resulted in Canada being the G7 country with the fastest recovery coming out of the pandemic and the G7 country with the strongest jobs growth coming out of the pandemic. So we have the expertise that we need right here this afternoon. So I'm going to just kick off with the, uh, the sort of first round of questions. The, the conjunction of economic forces that the world faces today uh, includes uh, pandemic and war, uh, includes escalating fuel prices and food prices, historic global inflation, at the same time that advanced economies are entering the monetary tightening cycle. It's a good time to talk about resilience and sustainability, uh, but, you know, and I'm going to ask each of you from your own perspective, Kristalina as Managing Director of the Fund, uh, Prime Minister Motley as the Prime Minister of a small island developing state, and Christia as Finance Minister of a G7 country, to approach this from your own uh, perspective. How do, how do small countries in the Caribbean, in this context, think about resilience and sustainability? Um, thank you, Prime Minister Motley, for um, uh, bringing us to Barbados, uh, not only to discuss uh, our very good cooperation with Barbados, but also to have a meeting uh, with the broader region. And uh, it is the right time to have that engagement. Why? Because we are experiencing a crisis upon a crisis, and here, because of climate shocks, there could be even more to come. So, uh, for the whole world, what is very clear from the last two years, if it wasn't clear to us before, is that we do live in a more shock-prone world. And shocks very rapidly go around the globe. A small virus originates in Wuhan, in China, and then it goes within weeks to all continents. A war, Russia starts in Ukraine. It is causing price shocks here in the Caribbean with food and energy prices shooting up. And for the Caribbean, there is also the specificities that you know very well. These are small economies that have less diversity of response capacity as a result. And the Caribbean is particularly vulnerable to we are, what we are already experiencing, a changing climate. 
So how do we think of the Caribbean? First, we recognize that quite a number of countries, exactly because you are the front line of, in this shock-prone world, have taken decisive action over the last years to build strong capacity to buffer themselves again the, against these shocks. I would put a very simple analogy. The same way a person with strong immune system is more resilient to COVID, the economies in the Caribbean that have taken decisive action to strengthen their buffers, to strengthen their fundamentals, when the shock hits, are more able to sustain it. And the lesson from this is to, for, to every, uh, everyone, do as much as you can to build that uh, economic financial resilience. Second, the region is incredibly strong because of its people. I am never ending my impression when I, when I communicate with people in the Caribbean of the um, ability to help each other uh, and the ability to recover quickly when a shock uh, comes. And third, what I saw here today, very encouraging, is more cooperation among the countries in the Caribbean. Together, you are stronger. And what I would aspire is that the IMF in our work, we turn into a resource for you individually, but also collectively to be stronger uh, for the future. And this is where the Resilience and Sustainability Trust comes. Uh, I, I, I hope I can return to this uh, uh, again, but let me just give you the telegraphic definition. This is an instrument, first time in the history of the IMF, that provides long-term financing, long-term maturity for structural transformation to build resilience. And it is an instrument that for the first time in the history of the IMF recognizes vulnerability as a criterion for concessional financing. And at that point, I have only one plea for the audience. Give a round of applause to this woman on my left, because she championed it. Thank you. Thank you, Cristalino. And indeed, uh, Prime Minister Motley has been a, a champion of, of uh, ensuring that vulnerability is taken into account uh, for concessionary financing. So on that score, Prime Minister Motley, at a time when uh, persons in the Caribbean, uh, citizens of the Caribbean, are concerned about short-term resilience, right? about uh, being able to absorb and uh, to survive the conditions of today, how do we talk about long-term resilience? How do we deal with the trade-off between the necessity of planning for the long term and the needs of today. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you, um, Cristalina, for your very kind comments. But as we all know, um, without your listening ear and courage, we would not even be able to say that we've scored a victory in this leg of the relay that has allowed us to have vulnerability after 32 years of arguing considered for the first time by an international agency to be one of the key conditions for accessing um, concessional funding. So thank you for a round of applause. L let me say that we in the Caribbean have long known how to walk and chew. We had no choice. We were transplanted into this region and we had to survive. And survival, therefore, is part of our DNA. Um, there is no doubt that our people are consumed now with how to cope, because that's really what we're talking about, how to cope with the increased food prices, the increased fuel prices, all of these things up until this morning. 
I had ministers on the radio trying to speak to these issues. At the same time, we all know that if we don't fix our housing stock, if we don't deal with coastal erosion, if we don't deal with salt water incursion into our wells, that within three, five, six, seven years, we will be dealing with a far greater disaster than we have. So we're trying to think outside of the box, but in order to do so, we need fiscal space and we need policy space. We need policy space that allows us to protect our farmers so that we don't have people flooding our markets with cheap produce when at the same time, if there are supply disruption problems as we're now seeing, that produce is not available to our people. And therefore, we need to be able to allow our people to grow the food that they eat and eat the food that they grow. But that's going to mean that our farmers need to be able to make money 24 7, 12 months a year from growing or, or at least be in the ballpark of it rather than having to have gluts um, of food that they can't sell because our supermarkets are importing cheap food that is being subsidized, quite frankly, from elsewhere. Secondly, we need to be able to ensure that we can treat to our water issues in a credible way because if we don't reduce the level of non-revenue water, it makes no sense trying to augment water because if half of what you're pumping goes into the ground, then you have problems. But we have to be able at the same time to give people immediate access to water and to keep it affordable. So that's going to mean, therefore, that we have to find ways, and in Barbados, what we did was to try to find a way that broadens the base but protects the most vulnerable by ensuring that there is a lower tariff for the first eight cubic meters of water usage, a, another tariff for eight to 20 cubic meters, and another tariff for over 20 cubic meters, and that we then have a separate tariff for agricultural access because equally, as one of the 15 most water scarce countries in the world, if we don't find a way of giving people access to water, asking them to grow what we need is just a useless concept. Thirdly, we need to ensure that we wean our people immediately off of fossil fuels while at the same time giving them an opportunity to earn money. The revolution in renewable energy must be that. It must not be seen as something that consolidates wealth either domestically or allows for a dilution of wealth because of people coming in with foreign capital. And therefore, what we've tried to do is to partner the revolution in renewable energy with things that people need urgently. If I'm paying $800 a month in rent, as happens with too many of our people, if I can give you a house with a mortgage at $500 and at the same time allow, in some instances, either you keep the roof and take the revenue from the roof or you assign the revenue from the roof to the developer so you don't pay the land costs as is happening with our HOPE program, then I believe that we can balance long-term interests with immediate interests with this. As it relates to the very, very immediate as tomorrow, next week, and next month, we're going to still have to provide some level of shielding. We've done it here in Barbados with an initial measure that allowed us to cap the rate of the VAT on the fuel so that we pass through the cost of the fuel, but we at least try to shield you by not taking as much taxes and capping that. Regrettably, we're going to have to look at it again. And as recent as Monday, we set up a committee within our social partnership to look at the underlying increases in food and fuel costs with an understanding that within two weeks there would also be the labor, private sector, and government meeting such that on the 8th of July when we meet back, we put ourselves in a position to take decisions that will help families in this country, particularly since the summer vacation is coming, and we all know that children love to eat a lot of food when they're running about. So that unless families can be helped over the course of the summer, we're not going to be able, and we may have to use the school meals program and other things to continue doing that which um, they do during term in order to offset some of the initial things. But it's gonna need policy space, is going to need fiscal space. I'll say this last point. Thank you to the IMF over the course of the last two years with the double crises coming on top of climate. We were able to adjust what we were able to do fiscally, and that made a tremendous difference to this country's being able to ensure that we did not have people fall through the cracks in the middle of a pandemic or after three climate events 
from the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent, which shut down our airport for a week, to the um, freak storm, to Hurricane Elsa, the first one in 66 years. So that follows policy space and fiscal space is absolutely critical to allowing people to cope while allowing us to meet the, it's not even long term, the medium term adaptation that's critical. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. I just want to welcome the audience that's joining us online. And at this point, uh, particularly uh, welcome Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, uh, who we're so pleased is here. I know she had budgetary commitments, I believe, earlier this, this week, um, but she's uh, here with us. And Canada represents the Caribbean on the executive board of the IMF. Uh, and so uh, we work very closely with uh, you know, the Canadian Ministry of Finance officials. So Christian, we're here talking about building resilience. And a lot of the resilience from a, from a Caribbean perspective uh, is resilience against natural disaster, which has been exacerbated by climate change. The, the question that we'd have for you is, what is Canada uh, doing about uh, climate change? You know, how are you advancing the climate change agenda? Okay, well, can you hear me? Yes, hearing you well. I see some nodding. Excellent. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. Ça me fait un tellement grand plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Uh, même en façon virtuelle. Um, it is great to be with you. I really wanted to join you in person because, as Nigel says, there are special close connections between Canada and the Caribbean. And Prime Minister Trudeau asked me to say hello to everyone. Uh, but we are just a few days from the rising of the House of Commons, and I need to get my budget bill passed. So the Prime Minister said that was my first job. Um, but it's great to be able to be with you virtually. Um, and just quickly, a couple of things. Um, Nigel, you said that Prime Minister Motley needs no introduction in Barbados. I can tell you she needs no introduction anywhere in the world. She is a force to be reckoned with. And a woman whose wisdom we definitely listen to here in Canada. Uh, so it's really wonderful uh, to be with you, Prime Minister. And I thought you made some excellent comments just now. Um, another wise woman who we are very lucky is guiding the world today is Kristalina Georgieva. Um, we really are um, lucky to have you uh, in your job in these very turbulent times. You're a person who's known a lot of change in your life. And I think that makes a real difference um, in how you're doing your job. And I want to say thank you as well. Um, and of course, Nigel and I are fellow finance ministers, which is kind of a tricky job these days. So we have a lot of fellow feeling. Um, I'll make just a few quick comments. Um, I actually want to start by really recognizing, um, as a Canadian, speaking to our really close Caribbean friends and partners, I just want to start by recognizing how amazing you are and the tremendous pressure that you have been under in the last little while. Um, and I, I want to start by recognizing the particular impact that climate change has on you and also by recognizing the injustice. Um, you know, the countries, the rich industrialized countries have benefited a lot from the burning of fossil fuels over a long period of time and yet the you know, some of the deepest, earliest damage that climate change is doing is happening to you. Now, you know that, but I want you to know that I know that too, and Canadians really do recognize that. So that was pretty hard, and Prime Minister Motley has already been talking about the ways that you have been building in resilience, but then you had COVID. Um, and I also really want to recognize um, the particular a uh, challenge that COVID posed for economies like so many of yours 
that are dependent on people being able to travel freely around the world. Um, so that has been another particular challenge and shock. And Canada certainly gets that. And then, and then on top of all of that, we have inflation. Um, and you know, Prime Minister Motley has spoken uh, very empathetically and also very practically um, about the impact that is having and the way your governments are trying to deal with that. And Prime Minister, I really, I heard you very clearly also in your point about your farmers and that thinking about them needs to be a part of it. Um, and I'll just say two quick final things so we can get on with the rest of the discussion. You know, you've been talking about resilience. And I firmly believe that a big part of the resilience of so many people in this room is the fact that you are democratic leaders. Um, it is in these kinds of volatile times that we're living through, being a democratically elected leader is not easy. Um, I think we all know that. Um, but it does give us, I think, a particular strength because if we do our jobs right, we have that particular confidence of the people who elected us to represent them that you only get if people freely chose you. And Kristalina mentioned the war in Ukraine, um, which we're, it, whose consequences we're all experiencing in part through inflation. And to me, that's a real reminder that people are prepared to fight for their freedom and their democracy. Um, specifically, Nigel, on your climate point, I'll say two very quick things. Canada recognizes that we have a job to do uh, in supporting our partners around the world in climate action. And so last year, we doubled our international climate finance contribution to $5.3 billion. Uh, and we're very you know, happy to work with you on climate action. And then here at home, as Cristalina knows very well, we have a price on pollution. Um, even at a time of elevated inflation, we raised our price on pollution in April to $50 a ton. It's going up to $170 uh, in 2030. Um, we're committed to maintaining that price signal. Um, but something that we do do that I think is consistent with Prime Minister Motley's message about protecting people is the money that we get from that price on pollution, we give back to Canadians. Um, so for example, in the province of Saskatchewan, a family of four this year will be getting $1,100 back uh, as uh, you know, returning to families the revenues that are collected from that price on pollution. Okay, I'll leave it there. Very nice to be with you all. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, for that. So, uh, Cristalino, you have already mentioned RST. Uh, the IMF has introduced this, this brand new instrument, which differs from the normal IMF instrument in that it is extremely long term, right? Uh, 20 years or something like that. And the, the longest that the fund has, ha, the longest instrument today is much shorter than that. Uh, why did you introduce the RST? Um, and what do you hope it will achieve? And, 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 and maybe I should add to that. Tell us a little, I, know, I can see the excitement uh, when the topic RST comes up, for, and uh, for very good reason. Uh, tell us about the RST. It's your uh, baby, and uh, we're here to hear about it. Uh, the uh, reason we have decided that uh, we need to create a new instrument at the fund with longer maturity is very straightforward. Structural transformation needs to be funded upfront, but it is likely to deliver the positive impact over time. Let me give you one example. Uh, we know that adaptation costs are already present everywhere. But if the global average 
is uh, between half a percentage and 1% of GDP. The uh, cost here in the Caribbean is more in the order of 5 to 7, 8 percent of GDP. If it is to be done on scale and in a timely manner. Now, if we do not have instruments that allow that cost to be put on a priority list now, just to give, to take the example of water that Prime Minister uh, Motley uh, talked about. <clears throat> if there is no investment to protect fresh water in Barbados that is done now, the consequences would be dire. The benefit of this investment exceeds the cost multiple times, but it does not materialize Immediately, uh, we, we, there are many studies that say that uh, uh, a dollar spent on resilience would have four to seven dollars payoff, but it is not coming immediately. So we realize that if we are to insensitize our members to undertake structural reforms that would make them more resilient and also bring low carbon jobs, we have to take a longer timeline than our traditional lending. The ultimate goal is to prevent balance of payments shocks in the future. And that is strictly within the mandate of the IMF. But we don't want to kid ourselves that a, a, a program that is three to five years is going to be the right instrument to ask you to pay back in a short period of time for an investment that is for a longer impact. Uh, the second reason we decided to create the RST is because we have a very good instrument to help countries at the time of liquidity constraint and it is called SDR, Special Drawing Rights, that we bring to countries on the strength of our membership. We are the only institution that is able to translate the 190 members' strength into benefit of new liquidity at no cost to anyone. But, it is not a perfect instrument because when last year in August we distributed $650 billion SDRs to our members, it is done proportionately to quotas. So the big number, members got a big chunk of it. The small members that may be the most needy got a small amount. So we, uh, last year we proposed to our members in strong reserve positions, give us back some of your SDRs and we would lend them at concessional terms. But then we thought, would it be fair that we only lend to our poor, poorest members? We have an instrument called Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. And then we, we agreed, and it is uh, the, the innovation that we already talked about, that it should be open to middle-income countries that are vulnerable to climate shocks. What is uh, uh, the picture today? Uh, in April, our membership endorsed our board approved, and then we, we have uh, shared with our ministers, including uh, 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 Christian, the RST design, and uh, I would upfront accept that while it is good, it could be in the eyes of some even better. Why? Because access is still uh, related to quotas, 150% of quota for a small country is a relatively small, a small amount. But in the future we can address this, these issues uh, uh, together. We have received already pledges of around 40 
billion dollars. And we got these pledges listed on the day of our IMFC meeting. This is the governing body of, of the IMF. And I was, I, I'll tell you, I was close to tears because I knew we would get pledges. But we have a target of uh, at least 45 billion. And to get 40 billion within one meeting, it tells me that uh, this is the right instrument. This, it is something that, that everybody accepts is uh, right to do. Uh, we will be starting uh, commitments to countries from October on. In meanwhile, we are collecting the pledges, putting the infrastructure, how we are securing this fund money to not get lost. Uh, and we are also rapidly preparing ourselves to work with other institutions so when we, when, we, when we engage with the country, it is on a foundation already there for climate action. Uh, I want to finish by saying uh, I appeal to, to, to you, the Caribbean, lead the way. You are the region that is most pressed, but you're also the fastest learning region. So we count on you and you can count on us. Actually, when I walked in the room, I looked at the picture and I saw that I'm uh, with the same jacket uh, on the picture that I have now. And that is to say, here is the new IMF. Yeah. Truth in advertisement. Yeah. Ah. Brilliant. Very well. So just to, just to in, in summary, Kristalina, tell me if I have it right. The RST 20-year uh, tenure Right, so you, you, it's a loan 20 over year, 20 years. 20 years, 10, ten and, and a, a half years grace. And 10 years grace. 10 and a half, 10 and, ten and, and, and a half. half years grace. Which means that a country that accesses the RST today does not pay anything back for the first 10 and a half years. Exactly. And that is exactly to give that fiscal space that, that, that Mia talked about, the fiscal space to take the action that is costly, costly, but paramount for resilience of, yes. of the country. And then just for the, the final, the, 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 one of the other components of the innovation is that a concessionary financing like this normally would not be available to middle income countries in the Caribbean. Is that correct? Exactly. Uh, the, but this time? This time it, it is, is available. This is, this Please, is really yeah. brand, brand new. And I would tell you, I believe strongly that this should lead the way for others to follow, especially when it comes down to building resilience to shocks, and in this particular case, to climate shocks. So I hope that in, in some time, we, you would see us here lined up a number of leaders of organizations united to do the right thing. Yeah, on behalf of the, the, if I may, the Caribbean people, just to express uh, appreciation to you, Kristalina, even though we're not finished yet, uh, for this innovation. This is really remarkable. Please, a round of applause. So just, uh, just coming to you, Christia, because this 40 billion uh, that Kristalina spoke about, which uh, is probably going to go higher before too long, comes from somewhere, and it comes from uh, wealthier countries with strong external positions reallocating their SDRs and making them available uh, through the form of this resi resilience and sustainability trust. Can you expound on, and, and Canada is a leading member uh, who is engaged in this reallocation. Can you expound on why uh, Canada is doing this? and probably give us your ideas as to how we could get other uh, wealthier countries who are in a position to similarly uh, make this reallocation, how could we get them to the table? Or how could the fund get them to the table? Um, sure, well, thank you for the question, Nigel. 
Um, and let me just say, uh, Canada has contributed 2.44 billion to the RST. So this is um, this is a new facility that we really believe in. Um, and I do really want to recognize the intellectual and political leadership of Prime Minister Motley, of Kristalina, in creating this new facility. It's something that Canada 100% championed. Um, it, is, it is a long-standing gap um, that as you know, your partners and representatives at the fund, it's something we've been talking about, encouraged to talk about it by all of you guys. Because, you know, it's obviously the funds work to support countries that are, you know, at the edge of a crisis or in a crisis, clearly very, very important. And thank you, Christina, for all that you do and to generations of people at the fund who have done that. But what we have recognized really in our conversations with you is that there has been this very long standing gap that, you know, what about the middle income countries that have particular vulnerabilities, in this case to climate shock, that actually have the leadership, have the ideas. You know, Prime Minister Motley, you spoke about needing the policy space. That's because you have the policies that you want to put in that space. You know what you need to do. And the challenge has been that you don't have the fiscal space. Um, and, you know, I think very much championed by Prime Minister Motley, what Kristalina really recognized, and this is, I think Kristalina will roll her eyes, it's something Canada has been banging away at for a long time, um, that we need to have some ways to help middle income countries too. So I am so, so glad that the RST exists. Um, Canada has been glad to kind of help get it there, and we've been very glad to contribute to it. Nigel, you asked a really good question. How do we get others to get on board? Um, I mean, the obvious thing is to do what Kristalina and Prime Minister Motley are very good at, which is persistence, <laughs> never stop, constantly advocate. But I'll tell you something else. Um, I think, um, and you know, I listened carefully as Kristalina talked about how the people in this conversation, the leaders of the Caribbean, can play a real leadership role in the whole world. And you really can by making this facility actually work. Um, you know, nothing succeeds like success, nothing succeeds like you guys having really great policies that will build that long-term resilience that when you put them in place, people can look at them and say, wow, this is a fantastic investment. And we can see how 10 years from now, it's gonna make this country, this region, the whole world much, much stronger. Um, so I would say that's the best thing you can do. And, you know, I think you guys have a lot of great ideas already, um, but certainly um, any um, collaboration that we can have with you, um, we would really welcome here in Canada. And I'll bet we can learn a lot from your great ideas as well, because we need to invest in climate resilience in Canada too. Thank you, Christian. Thanks to you, your government and the people of Canada for uh, that investment in the RST. Uh, Prime Minister Motley, you know, uh, Kristalina, both Kristalina and Christia have uh, credited you intellectually and otherwise. Uh, you served as chairman of the development committee of the IMF uh, during mo of the World Bank and IMF. Yeah. 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 Okay. So she was my boss, nevertheless. And the World Bank. That's, yeah. that's exactly yeah. right. Right. So within. Those spaces and other spaces, you have uh, advocated for some of the uh, components that we're seeing in the RST uh, and components that Caribbean leaders have long spoken about. So we have what we have asked for. The question now is, uh, is Barbados interested in RST? Uh, 
you know, it's like, you know, the, pro the proverb of chasing the tire, right? You've caught the tire now. Is Barbados interested in RST? Should other Caribbean countries be interested in RST? And if so, why? Yeah. I think that um, short answer, the country is going to have the conversation in the next few weeks. Um, long answer, we have very little choices available to us. The bottom line is that while the RST um, will require of us some level of engagement with the IMF, and yesterday marked the end of the last board meeting for Barbados in a four-year IMF program, and I want to thank all of Barbados for walking on this journey. I want to thank Bert Lanselm for leading the effort on behalf of the IMF and doing such an excellent job. And I want to thank Dr. Kevin Greenwich for being the translator of the love language of IMF and Beijing in one piece. So the country has to go through that process now. But what is good is that the instruments that the IMF have are not only instruments that relate to more debt being incurred. And therefore, they're policy-based instruments. And given the fact that we've done a lot of the policy work already, it's not a far walk for us to do with respect to wanting to unlock the equivalent of what would be 210 million US dollars in Barbados, which represents just about 4%, just under 4% of GDP, probably at the end of this year. I note, however, that, Christine, you said 5 to 8% is the global average of what is required, usually. And we feel, and we want to thank Canada, we want to thank all who have contributed to the trust so far, but the truth is we are going to need more. And we're going to need more urgently because the timeline within which we have to spend the money for adaptation is short. It's less than 12 years. And we all know that particularly with coastal projects and having to do the feasibility studies that are linked to the calendar year and the moon, that it therefore means that if you miss one year, you one month, you may have to miss a whole year. We recognize that the private sector has no interest in adaptation because there's no rate of return. And if the IMF Result Resilience and Sustainability Trust is the only game in town, funding at concessional rates for middle-income countries, adaptation, then that is the message I have to carry to my people in Barbados here. But let me also make the point that in addition to us not having many options and us having to do the adaptation, and what does adaptation mean in simple terms? Nobody else is going to come and do coastal defenses for Barbados because there's no rate of return for it. Nobody's going to do some of the other things that we have to do in terms of securing house stops to ensure that we don't lose 60 or 70 percent of our low-income housing stock in the middle of a storm. But the RST is not only about climate. The RST is also about the pandemics. And whether it is COVID, which we continue to face additional costs because of vaccine charges that are still regrettably too high for countries like our own. We also have the antimicrobial resistance pandemic, which is critical for us to be able to stave off because too many of our people are dying because they go into a hospital, catch a super virus, and there's no way to be able to, to fight it. So the RST provides that opportunity for us to be able to access funding that will help us in two of the three wars, the war against pandemic and the war against climate. And to the extent, therefore, that we can continue to access it, we want to be able to see you have other countries beyond what Canada and the others who have come in have put in already, largely because we're going to need more. The point that I want as a precautionary point to make, though, is that if we are owning the costs that have been caused by others because of their behavior, in the building of the Industrial Revolution, where we, by the way, financed it through our blood, sweat, and tears, and are now on the front line of the war that has caused um, this damage because of the actions of the Industrial Revolution, then I feel that we really have to say to the G7 and the G20 countries that we are at that moment in time, that if you miss this bus in the next decade in allowing us to get it right, then you're going to have a new war to fight. And that is the war against migration, climate migration, and human insecurity. And the other point that I'd like to make very quickly is that because we are owning their problems on our balance sheet, 
it is crowding out the space that we have for our own sustainable development goals, as Didier would remind me, because we still have to provide education and health and all of the other things that the SDGs require of us. So we need to find a way. Is it that we're going to move away from the fiscal anchor of debt to GDP 60%? Or are we going to find a way of calculating and ring fencing out that which we spend on climate and pandemic so that we can still have the space to bring development to our people? How we resolve this issue is still ahead of us. And I hope that we can do so just as successfully as we've made this first claim in the first leg of the relay. The last point I'd like to make, and Christina, I want to thank Canada. I spoke to Prime Minister Trudeau last week at this at length, and we hope in Kigali, because we both have the responsibility of promoting the SDGs globally. But here's this. We need some more of the SDRs, and not necessarily only for the IMF. If we put some of the SDRs in some of the multilateral development banks, it will allow us to also do some more interesting things. We thought that we could have done a straight debt for nature swap when we restructured our debt. Regrettably or thankfully, Barbados's debt continued to trade basically at par until a few months ago, and it is still in the high 90s, I believe. So what we did instead was to approach the Inter-American Development Bank and Nature Conservancy, who have agreed to repurchase $150 million of our euro bond. 150 million US dollars of our euro bond, and in repurchasing it, refinance it at lower interest rates, and the savings over the 15 years is 40 million US, which will now go to finance a marine conservation trust. I would have liked for them to purchase all of the euro bond, which is about 530 million, but it would have required greater um, capacity and, and, and a greater ability to handle the risk from the IADB. Canada has, I think, about 15 billion SDRs. Ireland has. The Scandinavian countries have. And we would like to be able to engage all of you who have become the global leaders of development, quite frankly, and to say to you that those SDRs are like an archival um, note, a, a, a museum note and that we need in today's world, as we face the greatest economic crisis since World War II, and as we battle still the pandemic of a century ago vintage, um, first one in a century, that we would like to perhaps see a modest amount of those SDRs go to some of the multilateral development banks as well, to allow them to play a greater role in unlocking those issues pertaining to climate crisis particularly, so that it is a complementary act on top of what the RST is doing on its own. I'm not sure that you realize that I've learned to beg in public good, but I will continue to keep that begging going because I know that it is, women don't have them problems with ego, so I know that you know that. Thank you. You, you keep begging, Prime Minister. <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, behave like the typical man too, that when a woman beg, you benefit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Christine, you, know, you, you hear Prime Minister Martin, and the essence of the point is that, look, 45 billion is a lot, and we're very thankful and grateful for it. But uh, we also acknowledge that the resilience agenda, the climate change agenda, calls for resources uh, that far exceed that in quantity. I've heard you speak about the potential catalytic effect mm -hmm. of this 45 billion, that it can crowd in even more, which would be great. Can you just expound on that and explain to us how you think this RST can have a catalytic role in the Caribbean? Uh, let me first uh confirm that uh, women have no big ego and we have no problem to beg. As, <laughs> as Christia would vouch when we had uh, a meeting of the G7 finance ministers, that is exactly what I did. My message uh, was and is, uh, we got the um, uh, national 20% of SDRs committed and that's great, that's really great. It takes something uh, that on its own, yes, it, it, it is valuable, but we make that value much higher. But we had this uh, a commitment when uh, the world was hit by one crisis. Now it is hit by two crises. 
uh, can we think more ambitiously about uh, deploying uh, the SDRs? Uh, and I think, I mean, we of course have to recognize, and I say that very seriously, that for our uh, members in a strong reserve position, they have to protect the reserve asset quality of these SDRs. Otherwise, they become meaningless. So there is a, a, a caution that is driven by the interest of making sure that the SDRs continue to hold on their reserve asset uh, quality, on their value. Uh, but this is an important conversation. So I would say to Prime Minister Motley that um, we heard from uh, um, Minister Field and a very important message. Make it a success and there will be more. And I would echo that. So let's uh, roll our sleeves. We have something, 45 billion, not trivial. Let's make it work. And then we have uh, a leg to stand on and talk about more. For the regional development banks, I, am not, I was actually among the first to say, let's see how we can collaborate. And maybe there is a channel to be, to be used. At this point of time, there are two uh, obstacles, and they're serious. The first one is that for um, about half of our members, for legal reasons, for domestic le legislative reasons, they only can channel SDRs through the IMF because we are the institution granted with issuing the allocation. Uh, the rest, and, and, and I believe Canada uh, can be more open, but we do not want to divide the membership. We want to say, let's go in this uh, together. And the second uh, a very practical uh, reason is uh, that to create a mechanism that protects the SDRs for those who own them, we have worked at the IMF and we came up with something that is credible. We go further with the uh, uh, development banks, then we have to work on that mechanism. And I, on balance, I prefer to go fast. So let's move and then continue uh, the work. And uh, one of the uh, uh, important things to remember is that uh, uh, we, by doing uh, projects, we are going to work with other institutions. Already we are talking to the Inter-American Development Bank, to the African Development Bank, to the World Bank, how we can collaborate and then leverage the resources uh, for higher, higher impact. I am very keen to, where this is possible, to seek private sector involvement because perhaps bringing down the risk for a private investor in some countries can significantly increase the resources that are becoming uh, available. Uh, and we will put the matrix to measure leverage. So here is our uh, um, uh, funding. How much have we moved in the right direction for the right policies? It is uh, our uh, intention to be a, an example of collaborative approach because we no, no institution, no country can solve the problems we are trying to address alone. And uh, I want uh, to, to see how the um, RST is also an instrument for collaboration um, with, with those that we, we partner, but especially with the countries uh, and the regions. Uh, can I say one more thing? Yeah, thank you. And it is um, why we believe this work is absolutely paramount. Because if we don't build resilience, resilient people that are educated, healthy, with good social protection, resilient planet that can be there for the next generations and serve them as it serves us, and a resilient economy, one that like in Jamaica, like in uh, Barbados, has strong fundamentals, strong buffers, and can function uh, competitively. If we don't do that, the implications for the future are really dire. What it would mean, to put it in simple terms, is 
after a century or more of every generation living better than the previous one, we may end up being the first generation to interrupt this trend or even reverse it. We cannot possibly do that to our children. Thank you for that, Priscilino. So what I hear you saying is that the, you know, the SDRs are actually, I mean, they're, they're an asset of a, of a country and uh, part of the deal is to ensure that that asset is protected. And yes. the way in which the RST is structured, it provides that guarantee to the countries who are making the pledges, so to speak. Exactly. Right, okay, so uh, let me, Prime Minister, let me let's come back to you. Um, the financing, that's required, as we know, for uh, a sustainable agenda across the world, for climate change agenda, uh, is significant. Uh, some time ago, $100 billion was, was promised, or $100 billion a year, and that hasn't materialized. This, however, is a sign of hope. And as uh, Christy has said, if this works, it can catalyze other things working. Can you just share some thoughts on what you think the international community uh, could be doing uh, or what more could it do outside of this reallocation of SDR rights to make more financing available for a green agenda, for a sustainability agenda, for a climate change agenda? Well, let, let me say first thank you, Nigel, and I thank Kristalina for her explanations on some of the issues, and believe you me, we are aware of that, and that's why our request on even the SDRs is modest with respect to some of the complementary functioning. Look, the world needs to do more. And, and Kristalina's last point is haunting. Will we be the generation that says to our children that you will be worse off than we were when we were the beneficiaries of being better off than every previous generation um, simply? We feel that in addition to this excellent start with the RST, that we need to do a few other things that don't necessarily cost money in every instance. Barbados is the largest issuer of natural disaster clauses now in the world. If we have natural disaster and pandemic clauses, and I say and pandemic because our central bank bill, it's now the central bank act, veered off and included not just natural disaster but pandemic too because it is a triple crisis for us. Mm -hmm. If we see those included in loan instruments, the lender loses nothing because they've kept whole, they're kept whole, and in my view, they probably should lose a few basis points, but they're kept whole, and the money is paid back at the back end, we extend the loan by two years. But the borrower has the fiscal space in our case, it would equate to 18% of GDP in two years. Now, <laughs> that's, we're getting 4% of GDP with the RST. With the natural disaster clause, we will get four and a half times that amount to be able to deal with a population that is largely underinsured or uninsured. So the acceptance of those clauses into our instruments will bring tremendous certainty, ironically, and reduce the risk, and hence should reduce the cost of capital in a way that the status quo does not allow for now. Because the lender is worrying from the time you are hit, will you be able to pay or will you default? Secondly, we need also to be able, and, and, and let me say that Canada led the world, along with the United Kingdom, in the year 2000, on the inclusion of collective action clauses in debt. And in fact, were it not for those collective action clauses, Barbados would not be standing where it is today with the restructuring of our debt. We believe that Canada and the United Kingdom and other countries in Europe can lead the world with the inclusion of these clauses, um, natural disaster and pandemic clauses. Secondly, we believe that the way to delink from quota more is going to be to use a very simple definition of climate vulnerability. Part of the difficulty, and I, I've learned 
from the experience of going around and talking with people. If I say small island developing states, Guyana is not a small island developing state, nor is Suriname, nor is Belize in our own region. Okay, countries in Africa are being hit as hard by climate because climate is now a problem for between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn and is soon going to come to the North Atlantic countries. Um, we used to have a saying um, coming to, to a station nearby, tune in. Well, the climate crisis is coming to the North Atlantic countries any minute now. It's already there in fact, but it's gonna be worse as we go on. We believe that we have to stop and to get people to understand that the definition of climate vulnerability ought to be the mechanism used. And what simply could that be? And we're not saying that it must be, but if we don't put something on the table for discussion, it will not be. The possible determines the probable. The definition Barbados believes that should work is that if you have a high probability of a climate event or a series of slow onset events within the next two years that can cause you to lose 5% of GDP, then you should be considered climate vulnerable. Now, as I said, the technicians will take that and kick it about, but what it does is to allow us to have a laser-like focus on what potentially is there. Thirdly, we believe that there has to be a far greater open mind to facilitating new instruments and new possibilities. There is too much, because the world is so inequitable, there is too much philanthropic capital that has been garnered as a result of excessive and egregious profits for decades. We need to find a way of having the blended finance to be able to right size the double jeopardy that we face with respect to allowing more philanthropic capital to be able to help de-risk a lot of what the private sector faces and to be able to assist the governments with the adaptation expenditure. Similarly, Kristalina spoke about some other things just now in terms of de-risking. We need to perhaps use more innovative instruments taking first loss and allowing the first loss to be able to allow the private sector to say, okay, I'll stand up and take a little more. And thirdly, we need to recognize, and this we do with respect to the reform of the international financial institutions. Not the, the IMF is already reforming itself under Kristalina's leadership. We want to go even further, but the World Bank, regrettably, is still now a relic of 1945, catering to 1945 issues, and has not found itself into the 21st century. We need to ensure that the World Bank, instead of only focusing on the financing of low-income countries, starts to look at being that financier of global public goods, as the IMF is trying to do. The IMF has taken it from the different direction to avoid a balance of payments issue. We're making sure that you have a strong immune system. The World Bank needs to step up to the plate and start to say, these are the global public goods that if we don't guarantee their financing, they're going to jeopardize development across the world. And I hope that we can, in Barbados here at the end of July, start that discussion with our partners in the United Nations and in the Rockefeller Foundation, because it is the most critical discussion to avoid the next generation being poorer than this current generation. Thank you. Thank you, Pian. <laughs> so, so, Christia, you're, you're uh, Canada has been uh, a leader in climate financing. Let's recognize that. Um, and you've been at the forefront of many innovations, including what we are, have been discussing today. Uh, but as, we, as I've asked uh, Kristalina and Mia, uh, there's a lot more that, that needs to be done if we are to achieve the goals that that need to be achieved. And we're gonna need some breakthrough in terms of ideas and in terms of will. Uh, can you share your thoughts on what some of those ideas could be and, and how the fact that the climate crisis is coming to a station near you, as Pierre Motley says, uh, you know, how, how, how will that help to unlock wills? So ideas and will, how do we, how do we uh, increase global climate financing? Um, 
Well, thank you for the question, Nigel. And I do want to say, um, Prime Minister Motley, that was um, your comments just now uh, were really uh, excellent and thought provoking. And I really love uh, the vision that you have for how we have to bring our global institutions up to date for the challenges of the 21st century. Um, and I think you're completely right. So I just want to kind of start there. Um, and then Nigel, more directly to your question, um, look, I let me say a couple of things. Canada actually, and, and this is, I believe now I'm speaking not just about my own political convictions, but about where the majority of Canadians are. Um, we have reached a point as a country where we recognize the urgency of climate action. We recognize that climate change is a threat to us here in Canada. We recognize that it's a threat in the whole world. And we recognize that we have to do something about it. And you know, I spoke to you earlier about our price on pollution. That's a very powerful market-based mechanism. It's going up every single year. And we increased it this year, even in the face of higher inflation. Um, and to me, that shows a meaningful commitment. Um, and we also recognize, you know, we have to do our part in Canada. And we also have an obligation to do our part in the world. And I spoke at the beginning about the need to, about Canada's decision uh, to double our provision of international climate finance to 5.3 billion. Um, but, you know, Nigel, you asked about, you know, how do we marshal the will? And I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think it is important for us also to recognize that the scale of the challenge uh, of addressing climate change is really huge. Um, you know, we've been talking about the Industrial Revolution. Um, I think that the challenge still before us is as big an economic transformation as the Industrial Revolution itself was. It's, it, it's that order of magnitude. And I think as a result, we need to recognize, yes, public money, money from rich countries, money from our international institutions, that will play a part. But it is never going to be enough. Uh, it's not going to be enough here in Canada, and we are building institutions here in Canada to crowd in private capital, and it is not going to be enough internationally. And so that's why I really welcome the comments that Prime Minister Motley made about blended finance, um, about thinking creatively about ways that we crowd in private capital. I also recognize, Prime Minister, you know, you said right at the beginning, some of these projects, private capital is never going to finance because they do not have a return. And we need to be honest about that. There are some areas that are just not going to be appropriate for private capital. But I think collectively, we need to be very creative um, about ways to bring in both private capital, but also that philanthropic capital. Because otherwise, we just won't have, uh, th otherwise, there's just not going to be enough money there. And Canada is, you know, we're very focused on this. We're looking at things we can do at home. Um, we've set up something called FinDev Canada, um, which I know, Nigel, we've actually been working a lot with Jamaica on. Um, to uh, try to work on some of these approaches when it comes to development. And, you know, I just really um, welcome this conversation. And I hope that we can continue uh, to work on some new approaches because we really need them. Thank you very much, Christia.
uh, unfortunately, that brings us uh, to an uh, end. We've exhausted the time. It's gone by really quickly. I, I thought it's been a, a very uh, substantive and useful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking, first of all, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Canada, Christia Freeland, for joining us. And uh, thanking our host, uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley. Uh, self-styled beggar-in-chief <laughs> and of course uh, thank the managing director of the fund for the introduction of this well for being here today and for her presentation today uh, but even more importantly for leading the introduction of this instrument the uh, the resilience and sustainability trust uh, which is responsive to the needs of the Caribbean. I want to thank you for listening, for hearing, and for acting. Please give Christina a round of applause. And uh, on behalf of the three of us, we want to recognize our fantastic moderator. Thank you all very much.